Once a famous giant, the largest ship of that time. Now two grand pieces lying on the ocean bottom about 2,000 feet apart, torn by the catastrophic collision of time itself. The stern of the Titanic got completely ruined after hitting the ocean floor. But you can still recognize the bow since many interiors were left preserved. There's a type of bacteria found on the ship's rusticles. A rusticle is this brownish formation of rust. It occurs deep underwater when the wrought iron the ship is made of oxidizes. It means the bacteria eat the iron of the Titanic's hull, piece by piece. And it seems they might finish their snack by 2030, way sooner than when anyone would expect the wreck to be gone forever. You may think it would probably be easier to take the wreck out of the water so that we got to keep it, but it would fall apart if anyone tried to do that. It's been in the water for more than 110 years now, and is now so rusty that no one would be able to reconstruct some parts even if we managed to get the ship out of the ocean depths. What do you think? Could any of about 700 people that had survived the sinking of the Titanic hear it hit the ocean bottom? The largest ship that had ever been made till then disappeared literally before their eyes after all. But sound most likely wouldn't have traveled from water to air. We can't hear that well in water because our bodies are not designed to hear in such environments. And although passengers were close to the sinking site, the Titanic still hit the bottom a long distance away, 12,500 feet. There are so many underwater landslides and earthquakes we cannot hear, and they make way more noise than a single ship slamming into the ocean floor. Most vibrations and sounds must have dispersed over a large area. Also, the down blast of water, which many believe hit the Titanic after it had touched the bottom of the ocean, would have pushed back the majority of the potential acoustic vibrations. Plus, the bottom of the ocean is not hard enough to produce such loud noises. Many survivors said they had heard terrifying noises as the Titanic was breaking apart, but none mentioned hearing anything after the ship disappeared below the surface of the water. Some survivors shared how chaotic it was when passengers, mainly women and children, were getting into lifeboats. There weren't enough boats, and still, some of them weren't even filled to their full capacity. No one knew how to react properly in such a situation. The lifeboat drill had been scheduled for the morning before the Titanic hit the iceberg, but for some reason, it got cancelled. A giant ocean liner everyone believes is unsinkable takes a trip across the ocean. On its way, it strikes an iceberg and sinks. Yeah, we all know how the story goes. But what's scary is that it's also the plot of The Wreck of the Titan, a novel published in 1898, 14 years before the Titanic went to the ocean bottom or was even constructed. In the novel, the Titan, what a scarily accurate name too, didn't have enough life jackets, vests, and lifeboats for all the passengers on board. It was also the largest ship of that time, almost identical in size to the Titanic, and both the Titan and Titanic sank in April. Dorothy Gibson was an American silent film actress. She was also one of the Titanic passengers. She survived the catastrophe. Right after she came to New York, she started filming Saved from the Titanic. The film was released only one month after the ship sank. Dorothy was even wearing the same shoes and clothes she had worn when she had actually been on the ship. The movie was successful, but it got destroyed in a fire, so it only exists in memories, like Jack Dawson. Titanic wasn't all alone in the restless waves of the cold ocean near the iceberg it struck. The SS Californian was relatively close. Their radio was shut off for that night, though. At one moment, the crew members noticed mysterious lights in the sky. They immediately went to wake their captain up to tell him, but he issued no orders. Some believed it was just fireworks. They never realized it was actually a call for help. The flares crew members of the Titanic sent off to the sky, hoping someone would notice. By the time the SS Californian got the SOS message, it was already too late. Some say a full moon may have been the reason the iceberg crossed paths with the gigantic ship. A full moon may have caused incredibly strong tides that eventually sent multiple icebergs southward, right when the Titanic was crossing that area. 
Would you dare to taste cheese from the Titanic? The wreck has been under the ocean surface for more than 100 years now. It took more than 70 years to find it. By that time, most of the food that had gone down together with the ship had, of course, spoiled. But it's possible there's still some of it left. Some foods are protected from decay. For example, cheese. The microbes that turn milk into cheese create special conditions to protect the product from spoiling. Multiple things have survived the Titanic. A handwritten letter where a mother and a daughter wrote to the girl's grandma about the amazing journey they were on together. The letter has been around for more than 100 years and got sold at an auction. A battered pair of white cotton gloves was found in the wreck. Musicians on the Titanic played till the very last moment. Sheet music and one violin were found among the wreckage. The bell one of the crew members rang three times to warn there was a very close iceberg on their way. A pocket watch that stopped at 1.45 a.m., the time when the ship went under the water. Perhaps one person could have changed what happened on the Titanic. David Blair was a pretty lucky man. He was supposed to take the spot of the second officer of the Titanic. He was pulled out at the last moment, which eventually saved his life. It was a great thing for him, but something clouded his joy. What if he was the only person who could have done something to save the ship and the passengers? Back in the day, ships didn't have smart advanced technology like they do today. They couldn't see a threat on the horizon. Binoculars were pretty helpful, but the crew members on the Titanic didn't have access to the room where they were kept. David Blair was the man responsible for the keys. He left the ship in a hurry and forgot to hand over the keys that were in his pocket. Maybe if the crew members had had access to the binoculars, they would have seen the iceberg on time and had enough time to change course. It's possible that the giant iceberg that sent the Titanic to the ocean bottom was made of snow that had fallen in southwest Greenland. Scientists even used a computer model to calculate the paths the iceberg took in any given year, taking into consideration ocean currents and weather readings for that year. It's possible that the iceberg was 1,700 feet long, with a weight of around 75 tons. By the time it collided with the Titanic, it had dwindled down to only 1.5 tons. Violet Constance Jessup was, as many called her, Miss Unsinkable. She was only 24 years old when she joined the Titanic crew as a stewardess. On the tragic night when the ship struck the iceberg, she was lying in bed. As soon as she heard that something was going on, she got dressed and quickly went to the deck. Violet helped passengers get into lifeboats. Four years later, she was on the Britannic, the Titanic's sister ship. Once again, the ship started sinking. Not only did the woman survive another accident, but she was also once again the one helping other people to escape the vessel before it disappeared below the surface. It was September 12, 1990. In those times, way before instant messaging and Zoom calls, a little girl was looking for pen pals. Zoe was aboard a ship from England to Belgium on vacation with her parents. She was only 10 years old at the time, but was a very clever schoolgirl. She took a piece of paper and started putting some words together. She introduced herself, Hello. then wrote about how she liked ballet and playing the flute and the piano. Of course, she couldn't help but mention her two adored pets, Aww. a little hamster she called Sparkle and her fish Speckle. She also put down the address at which she could be reached in case someone was interested in writing back to her. But alas, she was at sea. Oh. Who could she send this message to? Hmm. An interesting idea came to her mind. Hmm. She carefully placed her letter in a plastic bottle, tightly closed the lid to protect it from the water, and threw it into the sea. The little girl's excitement faded away over the years as she didn't receive a response. Maybe the bottle got stuck somewhere. Maybe it was swallowed by some big, scary sea creature. Or maybe the water actually poked through the plastic cap and destroyed her message. Many years later, on Christmas, a letter for Zoe was received at her parents' house under her maiden name. The postage signaled that the message was from Europe. It was from a Dutch couple, Pete and Jacqueline Lateau, who had found her delicate bottle and were very considerate to write back. They pointed out that they had found the letter among the debris thrown at the shore by the sea. 
Zoe's letter had been stranded for a staggering 23 years at sea and traveled for more than 350 miles to reach its final destination near Rotterdam in the Netherlands. That's quite a voyage for a small plastic bottle. A story similar to that of Zoe is the strange connection between two little boys. A little German boy named Frank Uzbek was on a boat traveling to Denmark when he got the same idea as Zoe. He was five years old at the time he put together a message and threw it into the unknown. The year was 1987. He got his response years later, when he was 29. His letter, just like the one Zoe would send a couple of years later, had been at sea for 24 years. His message was found by a boy named Daniel Korotkin while he was on a walk with his parents on the Koronian Spit near the Baltic Sea. Danielle was lucky that his father knew enough German to translate the message. The unlikely friends eventually met via video call in 2011. Not all message-in-a-bottle stories have been explained away. In 2013, a Croatian surfer came across a damaged bottle while near the Adriatic Sea. The message it contained dated back to 1985, and it was from a man named Jonathan. The sender was eager for his letter to reach a woman named Mary, and he also expressed his keenness for her to respond. Since the letter was supposedly sent from Nova Scotia, the bottle had to have traveled a mind-boggling 3,700 miles. The message went from the Atlantic Ocean, entered the Mediterranean Sea, and reached the Adriatic shores in Croatia. The identities of neither John nor Mary were ever discovered. There are also messages in a bottle with wonderful love stories to share. This was the case for Ake and Paulina Wiking. When Ake, a lonely Swedish sailor, placed a letter in a bottle and threw it in the Mediterranean Sea, he had no idea the piece of paper would eventually reach his future wife. This was in the early 1950s. The bottle was found by an Italian man who was inspired enough to give it to his niece, Paulina. After a year of back-and-forth letters being exchanged, Aki and Paulina eventually met and got married. Having decided to share their story with the world, they became somewhat of a celebrity couple for the time. They even shared video footage of their wedding with the world, and their story was featured in a bunch of newspapers. This fortunate event started a movement between young people looking for love, increasing the number of messages being thrown out at sea in search of a fairy tale ending. Not all the stories that started out like this eventually worked out, though. In 1945, an American named Frank Heostak placed a similar message to that of Aki's in a bottle and threw it in the waters. Almost a year later, his letter was found by an Irish woman. Her name was Brenda O'Sullivan. Their years of correspondence soon caught the attention of the media at the time, but their friendship never flourished because of the added pressure. They eventually met in person when Frank traveled to Ireland, but he didn't stay for long, and they eventually got out of touch with each other. After Titanic met its strange ending, many bottles containing secret messages started to surface. Almost all of them proved to be counterfeited, apart from one letter. Years after Titanic had sunk in the icy Atlantic waters, a bottle was found on the Irish shores. It was supposedly from a man named Jeremiah Burke. And to this day, it is considered to be the only genuine message in a bottle originating from Titanic. The piece of paper simply stated the sender's name and the location, the Titanic, accompanied by the word goodbye. Since the date has washed away, it's difficult to estimate whether the note was sent before or after the ship had hit the iceberg. The common understanding is, however, that since Jeremiah was looking to relocate to the US, he was merely sending his last symbolic regards to his family and friends back in Ireland. This simple way of meeting and sometimes corresponding with people has turned into a hobby for a man from a Canadian province named Prince Edward Island, located east of the US state of Maine. This man, Harold Hackett, claims to have sent over 4,000 bottles into the Atlantic Ocean since 1996. He also claims to have received many responses from all over the world including letters from people in Europe, like France and Germany, but also from the Bahamas or even Africa. This unlikely pastime earns him about 150 Christmas cards from his pen pals each year. 
To this day, he refuses to add his phone number to any of his letters. This way, he ensures that if people ever want to contact him, the only means of doing so is via a written letter. He's also studied the best times to send the messages in the water based on the direction of the winds and the currents. Now, some bottles spend a whole lifetime at sea after being cast away by their sender. It was the case for a British man that wrote a message and placed it into a bottle before throwing it in the English Channel in 1914. His name was Thomas Hughes, and he wanted to direct the message to his wife but was polite enough to write a letter to whoever got their hands on the bottle first, asking them to redirect the piece of paper accordingly. The bottle didn't reach his wife, since it was found 85 years later on the Essex coast. The man that stumbled upon the bottle was kind enough to reach out to the family and place the message in possession of Thomas's daughter. And 85 years isn't the longest time for a small bottle to be cruising the waves. A scientist named Hunter Brown was studying currents in the North Sea when this idea came to his mind. He placed the same message in almost 2,000 bottles and requested the unlikely recipient that they write back with the location of their discovery. He thought this method would help him better understand the layout of the North Sea currents. A bottle was found about 11 miles from its original departing location after 97 years. To this day, more than 300 of the original bottles relating to Hunter Brown's project eventually made it to the shore. Not all of the messages that were found in bottles got replied to via physical letters. Oliver Vandevala threw a bottle containing a letter on the English coast while he was on vacation with his family. He was 14 at the time. 33 years later, a woman reached out on Facebook claiming she had gotten his message and tracked him down through his social media profile. Hmm. At first, he hardly remembered having placed the letter in the bottle, but he eventually recounted the events, <laughs> even the fact that he sealed the bottle with candle wax to make sure it was leak-proof. And then there's Christina Aguilera and her bottle. No, wait, hers is about a genie in a bottle. Okay, never mind. Can you guess how many theories of the Titanic sinking exist? Right, loads, including a theory of my own, which I'm going to share with you today. And then you can decide which one seems most likely to you. One Piece Theory The very first version of the events was the One Piece Theory. It's very simple and basically claims that the sinking happened without any breakups. 2.15 a.m., the ship collides with an iceberg. 2.18 a.m., the lights go out. The ship reaches an angle of 45 degrees and then quickly begins its final plunge into the ocean depths. 2.20 a.m., only about three minutes later, the RMS Titanic disappears under the surface of the ocean for good. The liner doesn't break, it just goes down as a whole piece. Of course, this can't be true. In April 1912, the Titanic was not only the largest ship in the world, but also the largest ship ever built. It's hard to believe that such a heavy vessel could have gone down without breaking. That's just impossible. Well, I mean, you can't blame the theorists. Before we found the wreckage, there were no other theories. Wait a minute, or were there? The day after the disaster, the survivors gave their interviews. They talked about what had happened, and some of them claimed that the ship had actually broken in two when it had been flooded. For example, Jack Thayer, a 17-year-old boy, outlined the sinking as he remembered it. And L.D. Skidmon drew a sketch based on his description. The picture clearly showed the ship breaking in half. But no one believed Jack or other witnesses. There was no evidence, so their claims were received with a grain of salt. But in 1985, things changed. First Breakup Theory that's when Robert Ballard found the wreckage of the Titanic in the depths of the ocean. When people saw the wreckage, it became clear that Jack and the other survivors had been right. The Titanic did indeed break in two when it sank. So it's time for a new theory. 2.15 a.m. The keel breaks, the starboard list eases, and the hull continues to bow and crumble. 2.17 a.m. The galley sections break off, the towers immediately drop under their own weight. The lights go out. The stern is pulled into the air. The bow breaks off and starts sinking. 
The aft is barely hanging on to the starboard side of the stern section superstructure. The stern section slowly lists over to port as it begins sinking again. It rises up one last time and pivots in a semicircle as it sinks. It all sounds pretty convincing, right? But people began to find plot holes in this theory. For example, the Titanic couldn't have held together until it reached such a high angle. The breakup would have had to begin much earlier. This only meant there was still a vast field for research and speculations. So people started to come up with their own possible scenarios. How about we look first at the ones no one likes? V-break and Aaron 1912 V-break. According to the first breakup theory, the Titanic reached a high angle and the weight of its unsupported stern caused it to crack from the top down. But it's physically impossible. So are there any other ideas? In 2006, Roger Long, a naval architect, decided to research a so-called V theory. 2.17 a.m. The breakup begins at a shallow angle, perhaps as little as 11 degrees. The upper structure fails and starts to crack. At this moment, only its double bottom is holding the Titanic together, but it starts to bend under the strain too, failing the ship. Water is pouring through the crack. It increases the weight in between the two sections, bending the Titanic the other way and pulling it into shape somewhat resemblant to the letter B. The upper decks get mangled and bent together. The bow heads for the bottom, and the stern is the last to sink. This theory has since been disproven many times, though. Roger Long believed it because the broken edges of the upper decks in the Titanic's bow section were all mangled and crushed. However, we have learned that it happened because of the so-called hydraulic downburst, the force of the water crashing into the deck as the Titanic hit the ocean floor. Another V-break theory states that the bow had risen out of the water after the break. This theory was mainly peddled by one former Titanic enthusiast. But not only has this theory been proved to be physically impossible due to the bow's incredible mass, it was also inspired by incorrect information. Remember Jack Thayer? Well, it was based on his sketch and the words of a couple of passengers. But the truth is, none of them had ever seen the Titanic break down like this. Jack himself even stated in an interview that the sketch was completely out of context to what he had actually seen. It was drawn by a passenger on the Carpathia, the ship that received the Titanic's distress signal and came to its aid. It couldn't be used as evidence. Now that we know this, let's move on to the theories that most people believe in. James Cameron's Banana Peel Theory. Who hasn't seen the legendary movie about the Titanic, right? It became the leader of the 70th Academy Awards ceremony in the number of nominations and awards, and deservedly so. But did you know that James Cameron had been interested in the Titanic for many years and studied the ship's history? His books and research are very detailed, and he even came up with his own version of the events. It's called the Banana Split Theory, and this is actually what you could see in the movie. Here's how it goes. The Titanic reaches a 23 degree angle and fractures down to the keel. The double bottom acts as a hinge as the stern falls down. When the double bottom fails, the bow and the stern separate. The stern lists to port, standing vertically, and then begins to go underwater. This theory is the most scientifically accurate one, along with Roy Mengott's theory. Wait, who's Roy Mengott? Mengott Theory Roy Mengott was an engineer who came up with the most plausible theory for the time being. 2.17 a.m. The lights go out on the Titanic. At this moment, the ship is at an angle of 20 to 23 degrees. Suddenly, the vessel snaps in two just around the third funnel. It causes the stern to settle into the water. The keel fails first. The draft and lower hull are crushed and break apart. Water surges into the bow and stern of the ship through the huge cracks, causing the bow section to sink beneath the waves. The stern rises up to the angle of 70 to 90 degrees, and then it sinks too. This theory seems to make the most sense, but it's quite controversial. 
The survivors who saw the breakup stated that the stern had settled back with the bow completely missing. Mengott's theory, however, contradicts that statement, while James Cameron's scenario takes this into account. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? The truth must be somewhere in the middle. My version. Now, as promised, I'll provide you with my version of the events. Well, it's not really my theory. More like a combination of Roy Mengott's and James Cameron's ones. I believe that James Cameron was right about the breakup. 2.17 AM. The ship is at a high angle. The lights go out. Then it snaps into two pieces. The bow starts sinking. The double bottom is still attached to the stern for a minute or so. Once the double bottom fails, the two parts separate and the bow goes down. Then, as Mengot said, the stern rises up at a high angle and then it begins to sink vertically. It might have actually happened because the survivors stated that they had seen a clean break. This means it couldn't be hidden. And they had also seen the stern staying vertically in the air for a long enough time probably a few minutes before disappearing. Anyways, all of these are just speculations. Regardless of how the Titanic broke apart and sank, it was a great tragedy. It's already been 110 years since the Titanic collided with an iceberg and sank. Did you know that in 2022, the Blue Star Line Company is completing the construction of an exact replica of the Titanic? Called the Titanic II Liner, the ship will be sent sailing along the same route with 2,400 people on board. Let's hope that everything goes well for them. It seems like we all cried watching the heartbreaking goodbye of Jack and Rose from the Titanic. Oops, spoiler, sorry. But the real-life stories from the sinking of the famous ship were no less touching. Joseph LaRoche was born in 1886 in Haiti to a wealthy family. He was growing up without a dad, but his mother was a self-made woman and a respected merchant. His uncle was the head of his country. Joseph was fluent in French, Creole, and English. At the age of 15, Joseph realized he wanted to become an engineer. There were no engineering schools in Haiti, so he moved to France to get his education. The journey took him a whopping 83 days. Still, in his student years, Joseph met Juliet in a suburb of Paris through a mentor. They soon became friends, and then it grew into something bigger. The couple decided to get married. There was only one problem. Joseph couldn't find a well-paid qualified job even after completing his studies because of racial discrimination. The intelligent young man realized he could do better. Plus, he needed to provide for his growing family. His third kid was on the way. His uncle back in Haiti promised he'd help Joseph secure a job as a mathematics professor. His mother was overjoyed that her son and his family would be living in Haiti. She bought them first-class tickets for the French liner La France as a reunion gift. But that liner had really weird rules separating parents from their offspring for meals. The LaRoches didn't want to leave their youngsters and make them feel sad on a trip across the ocean. So they decided to trade their first-class tickets for La France for second-class tickets for RMS Titanic's maiden voyage. The Titanic was all the hype, and it didn't separate families, so it looked like a great deal. They planned to change for another ship in New York that would take them straight to their final destination in Haiti. The family boarded the Titanic on April 10, 1912, at Cherbourg. They had three days to enjoy the luxurious staterooms, a dining salon, a library, and three outdoor promenade decks available to second-class passengers. Juliet sent a letter to her father from Titanic's final stop in Queenston, Ireland. She told him they were more than happy with the accommodation. They had two bunks in their cabin and a couch that converted into a bed for their youngest family members. The family made friends with some nice co-passengers with whom they had traveled together from Paris. She thought they had been the only other French people on board, so they sat together for meals. Juliet mentioned they had all spent time together on the deck of the liner. She also wrote the people on board were friendly, although some sources say the family had gone through quite a lot of mean stares, gossip, and remarks. On the night of April 14th, their exciting journey came to an abrupt end. Even though Titanic's wireless operators had received warnings about drifting ice from nearby ships, 
the liner continued to plow ahead at full throttle. It was around 11.40 p.m. when Titanic's hull collided with the iceberg around 370 miles off the coast of Newfoundland. The practically unsinkable ship was severely under-equipped with lifeboats, enough for only about half of its 2,200 passengers. The nearest rescue ship, the Carpathia, was too far away to help. A steward woke up the LaRoche family and took them to the lifeboats, as Juliet remembered later. She couldn't speak any English, so everything that was going on seemed even scarier to her. A little after midnight, the crew received the order to give priority to women and children when boarding the lifeboats. Juliet later remembered a terrible panic had begun, as people had been pushing each other to get to the desired seat. At some point, she felt they had pulled away her older daughter and thrown her into the abyss. A moment later, she had joined her Simone in the same emptiness. So, pregnant Juliet and her two daughters got spots in lifeboat 14. But they had to say goodbye to Joseph as the boat was being lowered into the sea. He wrapped his coat around Juliet, saying she'd need it, and promised to get in another lifeboat and see her and the little ones again in New York. The 25-year-old Joseph LaRoche didn't manage to stay true to his word. In a couple of hours, Titanic sank underwater, taking the lives of almost 1,500 people. Joseph was one of them. Juliet and the girls were among the 700 survivors who had been rescued by the Cunard liner Carpathia several hours later. Once they reached New York, they were looking through the crowds of people, hoping to see Joseph again. When it became obvious they wouldn't find him, it was time for them to decide what to do and where to go. Without any knowledge of English or money that had gone down with the ship, Juliet managed to survive in America only for three weeks and then had no other choice but to go back to France. Joseph's uncle was no longer able to help them, as others had taken his life four months after the Titanic tragedy. In December 1912, Juliet gave birth to a son who she named Joseph after his father. For the rest of her life, she couldn't get over the loss of her beloved husband. That's why she didn't like to speak about what had happened on Titanic and told her children not to mention it. In 1995, a member of the Titanic Historical Society interviewed Louise, who was the last remaining LaRoche child and the last French survivor of the sinking. And that's when the world first heard about this heartbreaking story. It inspired some plays and articles, but it never got the same attention as the story of other passengers. You probably remember the elderly couple going down together in their bed on the Titanic. It was inspired by Isidore and Ida Strauss. They were both born in Germany and emigrated to the United States as kids. They met in New York and got married five years later. Isidore started a china and porcelain business with his brother that grew into the glassware department at Macy's and turned them into multimillionaires. Isidore and Ida were well known in New York, not only for their wealth and charity, but also for their love and devotion to each other. In 1912, the couple decided to run away from the New York winters and headed for Europe. By that time, they'd already been married for 40 years. In early April, it was time for them to sail back home to New York. They normally traveled on huge German liners, but at that time, they couldn't resist the hype of everyone talking about that new luxury liner, the RMS Titanic. That's how they ended up in one of the first-class private suites at the top of the ship. The Strauss couple spent their evenings dining in front of a live orchestra in a hall filled with fancy furniture and expensive wooden paneling. On the night of April 14th, they felt a slight tremor and then left their private suite and waited for instructions from the crew. They told the passengers not to lose their passes, as they'd need them when everyone got back on board. But the ship was going under. The Strauss couple were standing next to lifeboat 8. Mr. Strauss, who was 67 at the time, was offered a seat with his wife because of his age. He refused it, saying he was not too old to sacrifice himself for a woman. He wanted to wait and make sure no women and kids were left behind. Ellen Bird, Ida's maid, hesitated before getting on the lifeboat. But Ida told her to go. She took the easy decision not to leave her husband on the sinking ship. Ida took off her beautiful mink coat and handed it to her shivering maid, saying she wouldn't be needing it anymore. 
Isidore didn't manage to convince her to save herself, so they stayed together till the end. Some of the surviving first-class passengers later remembered they had seen the couple standing peacefully on the deck, holding hands, just waiting. A beam of electric light pierces the darkness over the calm waters of the Atlantic Ocean. The Titanic is quietly making its way through the waves, its passengers asleep, when suddenly a monstrous white shape is caught in the light beam. The fateful iceberg is about to rend the side of the legendary ship. April 14, 1912, only two days before someone will take a photo of a giant iceberg with a pretty unusual elliptical shape. It turns out that this iceberg most likely formed out of snow that fell 100,000 years ago. Researchers use computer modeling to figure out its origin. They used data from 1912 and added some new information about winds and ocean currents. They concluded that the iceberg was probably a part of a small cluster of glaciers in southwest Greenland. These days, it's possible to calculate the roots of such icebergs in any given year in the past. So the infamous chunk of ice was on its way from Greenland to an area further south from Cornwall. If the ship had passed through that region only two days later, the iceberg would have moved far away from the point where they met. At first, the weight of the most well-known iceberg in the world was 75 million tons. With time, it started to slowly melt away. And when it sank the Titanic, its weight was only 1.5 million tons. By the time of the collision, it had probably been melting for months. But it was still a true monster. When the Titanic sank, the iceberg was 400 feet long, and more than 100 feet of its surface was above the water. Some people believe it was a supermoon that caused the Titanic to sink. That night, there was a rare lunar event. It hadn't happened for 1,400 years. In normal conditions, the iceberg wouldn't have traveled so far south without melting and losing the largest part of its mass. But the supermoon could have been the reason for an unusually high tide that pulled the iceberg away from the glacier way faster than usual. There's a specific type of bacteria that slowly consumes the remains of the Titanic. Salt corrosion, ocean currents, freezing temperatures, plus this rust-eating microorganism might consume the entire wreckage. American actress Dorothy Gibson was aboard the Titanic. She survived, and when she arrived in New York, she started filming a movie called Saved from the Titanic almost right away. The movie was released only a month after the Titanic sank, and in the movie, She even wore the same shoes and clothes she had during the actual disaster. The movie was a big success at that time, but the only known copy was destroyed in a fire. 14 years before the Titanic sank, a novella called Futility had been published, and it seemed to have predicted the whole event. The plot centered around a fictional ship called the Titan that sank during its voyage. The Titan was almost the same size as Titanic and they both went to the bottom in April. The reason was hitting an iceberg, too. Both the real and fictional ships were described as unsinkable, and both of them had the legally required number of lifeboats, which, as it turned out later, were nowhere near enough. We've seen it in the movie, but there were some real-life love stories happening on the Titanic, too. Thirteen couples even took a trip on the Titanic as part of their honeymoon. One of the couples owned Macy's department store in New York. Once it became clear the Titanic was rapidly sinking, the woman refused to go into a lifeboat without her husband. But he didn't want to join her while there were still women and children who he thought had to go first. Then his wife gave her coat to her maid. She insisted that the maid should get into the lifeboat, and she wanted her to be warm. As for the woman herself, she decided to stay with her husband till the end. Some people believe Titanic sank because of a mummy, not an iceberg. It all started around 1000 BCE with a mysterious woman who lived in Egypt, in the city of Thebes. People knew little about her, 
but they called her a priestess. Her mummy was put in a wooden sarcophagus and covered with a large lid with the image of her face and some mystical inscriptions. This place had been hidden until the first half of the 19th century, when a group of locals accidentally came across it. They disturbed her peace. No one knows how, but the mummy disappeared that day without a trace. A couple of decades later, a group of rich friends from England traveled to Egypt and found the empty mummy casket with the image of the priestess, whose dark eyes seemed to be looking into the void. They decided to buy it, but the buyer disappeared the same night before he even got the case. All members of the group had some accidents. The casket changed its location a couple of times until it, as some believe, ended up on the Titanic. It took more than 70 years for a robot submarine to find the ruins of this legendary ship. The wreck lies nearly 13,000 feet under the surface of the Atlantic Ocean, split into two halves. Why did the liner break apart? No one knows exactly. Some think it happened because of the water that got inside when the ship collided with the iceberg. The pressure was so powerful it separated two parts of the vessel, starting with the ship's bottom structure. Others say it was because of the hull rivets. They had a high concentration of slag or smelting residue. And that's something that can cause the metal to split apart. The ship generally had many flaws, starting with the design. The watertight bulkheads weren't completely sealed on top. This allowed the water to flow between the compartments and, in the end, sink the vessel. The iron of the ship's rivets and steel of the hull ended up ruined because of high sulfur content, cold temperatures, and high speeds. The steel shattered and the rivets popped out quite easily. Because of this, Titanic sank 24 times faster than it would have otherwise. If the ship had hit the iceberg head-on instead of ramming it with its side, it would have probably stayed afloat. How come the crew members didn't have binoculars? It would have surely helped them spot the iceberg on time and maybe even avoid the disaster. But the binoculars on the Titanic were locked in a storage cabinet. Only one crew member had the key, and he had been transferred off the ship right before it set sail. He later said he hadn't remembered to hand over the key. But even without the binoculars, the ship might have had some time to change course and avoid the collision if the crew had gotten some warning. But that's the thing. Someone did warn them. About an hour before the incident, a ship that was relatively close to Titanic, the SS Californian, sent a message to inform them it had stopped because of dense ice field. But the warning never got to the Titanic's captain. Some experts say it was because the radio operator didn't think it was that urgent. And later, the SS Californian said they didn't get a call for help from the Titanic because their radio operator was off-duty. Some say the crew on the Titanic couldn't spot the iceberg on time because of an optical illusion. Atmospheric conditions that night probably caused super refraction, which could have camouflaged the berg. After all, no one actually saw the iceberg until it was too close to the ship to somehow avoid the crash. Not even a whole minute passed between the moment they saw the iceberg and the collision. It was only 37 seconds. And it took Titanic 2 hours and 40 minutes to disappear below the ocean's waves.